Welcome to the XR Producer Beginner Course by Yahoo. I'm Henry Kaiser, and in this third video, we're going to focus on how do we go searching for 3D models we need for our project using 3D libraries and stores. Let's get started. I'm really happy to walk you through uh, this next step in the road. Um, obviously, in episode one and two, we talked about how do you start thinking about your project and how do you go from a vision that you maybe have to breaking it into executable steps. And one of those early steps we talked about was listing your 3D assets out. Because once you've got a list, you know what you're going to be looking for. Your homework in the last episode was to take that vision you had and to say, you know, what are the likely components that you need to be searching for in order to put your product together? Um, and then also you kind of know what their relative size and position should be compared to each other, compared to other components, potentially even compared to your user um, for your project. That the size and position portion will really come into play mostly during the blender phase next, but it doesn't hurt if you see something that, you know, why is this fire hydrant uh, a thousand times larger than the person in this 3D model I'm looking at on SketchUp? So it helps I've already done your mockups before you go searching. That said, um, you know, the reason why we go to these libraries is, as I mentioned early in the first episode, to make XR, you don't need to be a 3D artist. Um, there are lots of 3D artists who are already out there who are producing work, sharing it as Creative Commons. They're selling it in asset stores. And so as you are trying to quickly tell a story that is out there, just as you do not need to be a photographer to include photos in your story because you may be able to buy or license them or get them shared with you from some other source. You do not need to be a 3D artist or tell your stories. You can find the components that you need in a lot of different sources out there on the internet. We want you to feel empowered to say, I'm going to tell a story, I'm going to find the pieces I need, and I'm going to go ahead and get it republished. So uh, for your very first project, a big goal that we have here and that we want to make sure is, is impressed upon you is do not burn yourself for future projects. Um, and that, I mean, for your very first stuff, the stuff that as a beginner, you're just getting your feet underneath you, do not commit a lot of time into what you're doing and do not commit a lot of money into what you're doing. Think about a small project that you can execute quickly and that you have learned how to be scrappy and nimble in what you assemble. Because then as your skills grow, as your ambitions grow, you'll already have a bit of an understanding about what works and you're not learning all of the hard stuff while you're also spending money. Um, you don't wanna spend money on things that you wouldn't have been able to work with as a beginner. You should pick up some of those more advanced details down the road. With, uh, before we start searching, this is just a primer to help you understand when you have a vision for something, what is it likely going to cost you in both time and resources? Having already made a list of what we uh, need, the next thing is to really have a plan for what you're going to, how you're going to pull together the pieces for your list. So for example, I mentioned my subject is likely gonna be either 3D scans or cutouts. Well, if I can get a 3D scan of somebody, that's excellent, that requires photogrammetry, but a cutout is probably gonna be easier for me because I can go to a photo library like Getty or the Associated Press Library or Shutterstock and then I can license that image or I could take the photograph myself and just know that I'm gonna use it for my own project. And we can then cut out that image using a different technique. So for the purposes of my subject, maybe I could find a library model of a generic scientist, but we're gonna hold off on searching for a scientist um, or for a reporter character. And instead we'll use cutouts for that. Additionally, for my objects, the Perseverance Mars Rover and the Mars Planet Sphere both of those are things I expect I can find in the library. So that's what I'll be searching for first. And then when it comes to environment, I said I wanted to have like a Mars surface. Um, I may search for that, but if I don't find something immediately that I think I'm gonna be easy to work with or that I like when I'm zoomed in on it, um, so that when it's the right scale to fit the Mars rover that I'm gonna be placing on it, um, I can also then maybe apply an image to that uh, flat plane that we used as our skeleton floor and we can just make that image underneath our rover and that might be a strategy we employ in that route. So with a plan in mind, I can then go looking for the 3D model libraries. There are 
a lot of 3D model libraries out there. There are over 50 websites that position themselves as the library for various things. Some of them are 3D printing, some of them are for cars, some of them are for, uh, you know, consumer packaged goods or, uh, you know, off the shelf products. Um, but my usual searches are Sketchfab, TurboSquid, CG Trader, and Hum3D. Um, these are the ones that we go to the most often for our productions. Um, and you'll find links to these and more libraries in the video description and in the accompanying materials. Here on screen, you can see that I'm currently looking at Sketchfab, but then I also want to show you this is the home page for TurboSquid, and here's the home page for CG Trader, each of which includes a search box so you are able to immediately start searching and finding what you're looking for. For the purposes of this training, we're going to be focused on using Sketchfab. Now, the reason why we're going to be using Sketchfab for the training is first is both a store and a, and a Creative Commons library, but it also includes an embeddable player for when you decide to host and publish your work. And so it's great to have this as a one-stop shop for a lot of your training. Additionally, it is the platform that allows you to vet the three models you are working with in 3D and not just in screenshots and kind of lists of data. Uh, and so that means we can use it to really get to look at and understand what we're gonna be downloading before we've downloaded it. Um, and it has such a large Creative Commons library that it will allow us a larger uh, group of opportunities for whatever project you're working on for your personal project, your homework project. Um, it also converts every single thing it uploads into a GLTF file, uh, which it then uses to present it in the browser. And because Blender supports the GLTF file, that means everything or almost 99% of everything that is on Sketchfab's website will be usable uh, if it is a downloadable asset. Some things on Sketchfab are not downloadable. So as we now move into searching for what we're looking for, um, if you're logged in to Sketchfab, you'll, be, you'll land on a kind of a feed page of interesting things happening on Sketchfab that day. If you're not logged in, you'll land on a page that is similar to what's on the slide right now. Um, you will need to create an account before you're able to download any 3D assets. So it is worth knowing that you'll have to sign up. It is free to sign up for your account, um, especially for the downloading step. Um, but then as we get into that, we will use our search bar um, to start searching for our objects. The first thing I'm gonna be looking for right now is our Mars Rover. Um, and as I mentioned a moment ago, not everything on Sketchfab is usable, is downloadable. And so uh, the first thing I have to do as I search is I need to check this filter box that says, I want something that's downloadable. Um, that will then immediately filter out everything that is other content people is hosting on the site that they're not necessarily letting people use for their own projects. Um, from there, I also want to make sure that I uh, search really, we can start with specific words, but you may need to be more generic uh, if you are not finding a lot of search results. So for example, if I say uh, a 1950 Ferrari, uh, well, actually that, that worked out fairly well. You can see, I didn't quite get a 1950, I got 1970s, um, but at least the key terms there result in things. So as well, if I say Mars Rover, I may get lots of things, some of which are artistic, some of things are uh, more realism, but I can in this case say perseverance and rover. And I started to get more uh, specific search results. Now, before we start deciding which one we're gonna use, as a publisher, the very next thing we need to focus on is only choosing assets that you can reasonably republish. And so you can see there are a, is a filter for licenses and there's a fairly large list. Most of these beginning ones are all creative commons. Below there are your uh, royalty free assets that you'll have to pay money for, but they are either standard royalty free, meaning it can be used on all types of projects or editorial royalty free, meaning it can only be used on an editorial or a newsroom type project. Um, so you can see connection with events that are newsworthy or of public interest. So to talk very briefly about these, I like to focus on using only Creative Commons by attribution or Creative Commons zero. Um, the others have a modifier of some sort that says SA, meaning share alike. This means if you publish something using this asset, it has to remain Creative Commons. 
MD, which means no derivative. You cannot edit this 3D model once you've downloaded it. Or NC, meaning non-commercial. This project cannot be used in relationship with a commercial activity. Um, it can be complicated to decide whether an editorial activity is also a commercial activity if you are working for a company, a newsroom or media company. So I generally suggest that people only search for these four filters and for, to, for your training, if you're trying to avoid paying money for your first asset for your first project, you will also want to disable then the standard and editorial. So with these filters in place, Creative Commons by CC0 and downloadable, all the things that have then resulted in your search results are assets that you should be able to use in this project as long as you uh, attribute your work, if it was a, a CC by license or CC0, which means no rights reserved. And generally these things are then in the public domain. Um, so going through some of these, I see one Mars Perseverance rover. I see another Mars Perseverance rover. Um, I'm going to start with this second one um, because if I filter further to CC0, this second one, which is no rights reserve, uh, is available to us. And opening up this page, you'll see it loads in a 3D model of the actual object you're going to be working with. Instead of just, say, a screenshot, I can now look at this from a variety of angles and really get to understand what I'm going to be working with. As we work towards understanding, okay, this is the 3D model I may want to work with, I always tell people to pause and take a moment to vet the asset, especially if you're gonna spend money, but even when you're not, it's worth knowing you know, what asset are you tying yourself to? How much work might you be making for yourself? So with that, we're gonna go ahead and we're talking about vetting an asset in five different uh, ways of breaking it down. Mesh efficiency, texture quality, texture complexity, file size, and which license, of course, are you working with? We'll go through these each one at a time. So mesh efficiency. Um, with mesh efficiency, the first way of breaking it down is poly count. Um, poly count can feel difficult to understand when you first work with 3D software, but fundamentally it's about understanding that all 3D objects are made of polygons, usually triangles or squares, and we call those, the shorthand is tries or quads. Um, and so for example, a cube, one of the most basic shapes is then considered six quads, six squares, or 12 tries, 12 triangles. Um, and that's how much uh, uh, it takes to make a cube. So it has a poly count of either six or 12, depending on how it was modeled. Um, the more polys that are in a 3D model, the larger the file size is going to be for that model. The more polys does not necessarily mean better, because if, for example, I find a cube that is 600 polys, it may give me pause to wonder what is it about this cube that requires 600 polys when normally a cube should just be six. It's unlikely that that 600 cube is better than the six cube. Uh, but depending on where you publish, will affect how large of a file you can eventually re-upload. Sketchfab can accept a very large or a fairly large file size for your eventual re-upload. However, if you're publishing on a different platform, and we'll talk about some of those in later episodes, then you should be fairly conscience, or conscientious about how, uh, how big it is, the various aspects, the various objects you're working with. So, Looking at the poly count on this Mars rover, for example, as we scroll down, you'll find it has listed triangles 199.3 K, which means thousand. So this is a 199,000 polygon Mars rover. And we can actually inspect that by coming over to the bottom right hand corner of our 3D viewport of this page. And we can click this icon that says Model Inspector. By clicking on that icon, we will see that we've got a whole variety of uh, ways of filtering how to look at this particular object. And so we have final render, no post-processing, base color, and so forth. But further down, and I promise this will be one of the few times we actually look at this mode, we have the wireframe. 
And looking at the wireframe for an object can help you understand where are all of these polygons involved in this object. So every white space is the face of a polygon, but every black edge is the edge of a polygon. So the more black you see, it does give you an idea of more polygons are there. And the more white you see, you understand that there's fewer polygons in that area. So the, the body itself is fairly low polygon. For example, this large face has just two triangles holding it together. But these tires have lots of polygons. And so there are lots and lots and lots of triangles here. If we ever need to lower the poly count of this vehicle or of this Mars Rover, which we will do in episode seven, um, then you will see that we may have to put more work into the tires than we do for the body um, in order to make sure that uh, we don't distort the body by removing a necessary face. Whereas we have a lot of extra faces we may be able to potentially remove from the tires. The next area of vetting an asset you're going to want to look for is understanding the material layers that are going into the asset. Um, when people put an asset onto Sketchfab, in many cases, they are not just putting it up there to sell it or let you re-download it, but they're also publishing it and hosting it from there. And so Sketchfab has a lot of tools that it uses in order to make an asset look gorgeous to help tell a story. Um, but that could be some post-processing that applied that's making it look better than when you download it to use it for your own purposes or look different when I mean, you download it to use it for your own purposes. So if you see an option for no post-processing, I suggest you immediately flip into that mode as you inspect your asset. Immediately from here, you can see that some of the uh, colors have, have become uh, less dark because the lighting is no longer casting uh, a different kind of lighting tone and palette to the various parts. This model still looks excellent. Um, but again, it's just a note, hey, don't look at the final render, look at the, that the post-processing turned on. The next thing to note is how many material channels does it have that are being used to assemble the, the entire look and feel of this 3D asset. Um, there are a lot of potential channels and some of which are almost always there, some of which are rare to come across. Um, but what you need to know is that each layer is uh, doing its own thing to improve how the object looks, but is also adding a level of complexity to working with it. So in order to view what each layer is doing, uh, you can just toggle through them to see, okay, this is the base color. Base color being the general RGB value of the various points around the 3D model. And if I click to see not just in 3D, but 3D and 2D, I can see the various parts of the 3D object. So here is the image powering the sides of the body. Here is the image that's powering the various components on board the, the ship. And these are the RGB or the base color images. In the industry, we also call these the albedo layer or the diffuse layer. So you may see those terms used in a certain download or a certain project. Um, but in Sketchfab, they're gonna call it the base color and in Blender, they're gonna call it the base color. Um, beyond just the RGB values, is there something about the object that should feel metal? It should reflect light. So then looking around the various parts of the uh, rover, we can see, oh, this part of the rover is uh, less metallic than others. If the area of the rover is black, it has a high metalless value. If it is white, it has a low metalless value. Uh, but you just need to take a look and see how is it reflecting light. Roughness is about how sharp is the reflection of that light. So for example, brushed aluminum has a high metalness because it is aluminum, but it also has a high roughness because it is kind of grainy. Whereas a mirror has high metalness, but it also has very low roughness. And so the reflection off of a mirror is a very sharp reflection. Um, so that's what these various layers are doing. Normal maps are generally an artificial embossing as applied to a certain object. So here we can see that this part of the ship has a normal map, which is providing a extra level of kind of um, distortion. So while the base color is just gray, this normal layer 
is giving it a bit of a textured pattern uh, that wraps around this particular area of the 3D file. That texture is not actually uh, modeled in the wireframe. It, that extra bit of ripple and feel is just provided by this uh, special type of image. Opacity is used to visualize any parts of an object that are see-through. So here we can see that this area of the lens on the head is modeled with a bit of transparency. It probably had another part of the 3D model right behind it to show the lensing. And then emission is any part of the 3D model that actually emits light. This Mars rover does not have anything on it as emitting light. However, emission is one of the uh, default material channels, so it will still appear even when it is not in use. The specular F0 channel is a bit more uh, advanced. We're not going to really go into specular uh, right now, but you can see that it is providing some extra details around various parts of this 3D file. That would be a layer that would be more complex to work with. Um, however, we're going to bypass some of that by using the auto-converted GLTF, which should have all of these materials linked for us when it becomes time to download. The next thing I want you to consider is how big is the object you're about to download. As I said, uh, Sketchfab allows for fairly large re-upload sizes, but depending on where you're going, you're going to be really conscientious about the overall download size. If you're in the store, that download size should be right here on the right. But on this page for the Perseverance rover, we can click on More Model Information. And on this page, we can then see download size, 16 megabytes. Don't trust that number. I want you to always immediately click on the see all files portion of that page. Because a moment ago, it said 16 megabytes for this 3D rover. However, when I click see all files, first off, I immediately find this is actually made of a GLB file type, which is actually one of my preferred types if you ever get to come across it. And it's only 11 megabytes, which sounds great. That's even smaller. But also there are things like process textures that if you are downloading it and using it in a different format, the size of each of these is going to add up. Um, maybe when I was inspecting my model, I thought to myself, actually, I don't need the normal layer. I just want the base color layer. The base color is good enough for me, even if it's a bit flat feeling, or maybe base color plus metal will be enough for me and I don't need other images. And because each of those layers that have an image file on board that you can find, so for example, that normal map has this normal image that's on board, each of those layers is more files that you will need to be running in your 3D model when it comes time to uh, export and consider your total file size. These are all really small and optimized files, which are great, but in many pages on Sketchfab, you may find things that are 4096 by 4096, and instead of JPEG, they're PNG, and their texture sizes are one, two, five, ten 10 megabytes each. Very quickly, you might be working with a 3D model that is uh, 100 or 200 megabytes. Um, and while you were able to download it from Sketchfab, if you're putting it into a scene that has five or six or eight other 3D models in it, suddenly you've actually exceeded the total file size for when you go to re-upload to Sketchfab. And we'll talk about optimization in episode seven. But it's just to say, be conscientious about what is the total size you're downloading. Because also, if Sketchfab is not your final destination, size matters. So with that all said and done, um, the last thing you need to do before you add to cart if you're paying for it or before you download is again, take a look at the license for the 3D model. Um, if you're on the regular pages, you'll find the license uh, below some of the 3D model description. This is a CC0, meaning it is functionally in the public domain and anyone can use it for any reason without needing to provide citation. If you are working with a paid license or a paid royalty-free, if it's standard, use it however you want, but you and you are not required to give credit, but generally Sketchfab requests that you give credit if you are citing other uh, uh, libraries such as the Getty or the Sketchfab, or sorry, the, the uh, TurboSquid or um, Shutterstock or some other sort of library. 
Um, but if it's an editorial license, again, it needs to be used explicitly in editorial articles, not ads, not editorial. Um, and sponsored content is a gray area that I would say consult with a lawyer first. Um, if you have any questions about the licensing rules, please click on CH Fabs Learn More under the licensing entries for each 3D model. And if we're working with Creative Commons, we've mentioned those before, I encourage people to use CC0 and CC attribution. No derivative, non-commercial, and share alike both come with stipulations that can make it hard to republish. Um, and then it, equally though, if you are working with CC attribution, it is not a free asset. The thing that you are paying with is credit to the user who made it. So you need to be sure to include that block that says this work includes 3D models or an asset by person's name, a link if applicable, uh, and then you know by Sketchfab license under CC by 4.0, Creative Commons version 4.0. Um, it's a requirement, and that, that is what you pay uh, in order to use this free asset. When it comes time to download it, once you if you are logged into your Sketchfab account, you can just click download if you're on the regular pages and you'll be prompted with your download page. Uh, if you are purchasing something, you will find that you have the ability to uh, come to a purchases tab and you can download previously purchased assets from your overall purchases tab. That is a great uh, way of maybe you accidentally close the window, no need to panic. You can go ahead, you can find your way back to uh, what you've already uh, looked for. Uh, but as it comes time to download, uh, what we're going to do is we are going to have a choice. That choice to make is do you use the original 3D model file, the original format, which can come in many different file types, or do you use the auto-converted GLTF that Sketchfab has made um, on their site? Original formats can have advantages. There may be some small thing that was broken during the auto-convert on uh, Sketchfab. However, uh, the auto-convert will ensure that when you import it into Blender in a moment, all of the various texture images, the base colors, the albedos, however many images are required to power that 3D model are already going to be linked up for you. Um, and so for beginners, I encourage them to use the auto-converted format GLTF. Um, the rare exception is generally if you find a GLB, that's actually even easier to work with. However, I want to train you on the GLTF for now because it's rarer that you're going to find a GLB, whereas it's always that you're going to find a GLTF. So you'll go ahead and you'll press the download button and you'll be prompted with uh, saving the zip file to your computer. Um, if you work with Windows and Mac, they're a little bit different, of course, but you'll save it to a certain folder and then you will need to extract that zip as you prepare to import it. When we go to import, you'll be going to opening Blender, file, import, GLTF, and inside of your extracted zip folder, you'll find a scene, S-C-E-N-E, dot GLTF that you'll be able to import into your project. And that should go dead center in the middle of your scene. Um, if it doesn't load or if you haven't found it's loaded after a couple moments of looking at it, um, check the scene collection. You'll learn more about that in the next video. And you can see whether or not an object has appeared called root node. Um, if it has, it has imported. However, it is very possible that the object you import is either very, very small or infinitesimally large and you're not immediately seeing it. So in the next video, we will talk about how do you zoom out, how do you zoom in, and that may be something you need to do to try to find the 3D model that you've just imported into your project. Um, and so it may take a few minutes, of course, of searching to find your object and then to rescale it and recenter it for your own uses. We'll talk about some of those things in the next video. So with that done, I've got my 3D objects uh, downloaded. They're going to go in my downloads folder, but I also already have on uh, my desktop the uh, download. So if I come to my library, I have already prepared some folders, 3D models, and here are here is the 3D model that I've downloaded, which is scene.gltf, and it's already extracted. I like to put my zip folders into a backup uh, so that um, you know, you have them in case you ever need to go back and reference them, but you are not uh, required to, uh, you don't necessarily want to have two things side by side that have the same file name. So with those downloaded, let's go ahead and import those into our skeleton scene from Blender. So here we've got our skeleton scene open and we're going to navigate to file, import, 
and those were GLTFs that we downloaded. I've already gone ahead and extracted them, but let's find our way over to where they are saved. So here we can find, I've got a set of folders already prepared. The three model folders have where I've already extracted those folders and I include the zips then in a backup folder in case I ever need to find the originals. Let's go ahead and open up our Mars Rover that we've already extracted. And here we can go ahead and see that there's a textures folder and a folder that says scene.gltf or a file. That is the file that we need to import. So we can just double click on that. And after a couple seconds for it loading, we can find it in our scene now, we've imported our 3D model. Two things we should point out, you may notice all these little spindles, all of these icons uh, that are around this 3D model that weren't there within Sketchfab. That is markers of empties. We'll talk more about empties in the end of the next video, but just to say that these are things that will not be reflected when we go to export this eventually. So don't be alarmed, why are those things in my scene? The other thing I wanna point out to you is as you do this in your personal project, while this one imported at a good scale front and center, it is also very likely as you import uh, products that you've, or import objects that you've downloaded from Sketchfab that you may find the objects are uh, very, very small. You may struggle to have to zoom in and find them, or you may find that your objects are almost infinitesimally large and you have to zoom far out, sometimes even further than the default render view of Blender uh, in order to find your object. What I'll tell you is if you're not immediately seeing your object, wait 10, 15 seconds to just kind of know if it loaded and also check the scene collection. You'll learn more about the scene collection in the next video, but you'll find, oh, something called root node is now in my project. And that is the 3D object that you imported. If you're not immediately seeing it, try zooming far in. You'll understand how to zoom in the next video or try zooming far out. You'll learn how to zoom out in the next video. If you don't find it, you may need to increase the view distance or you may need to start looking not just in the middle, but in different areas of the scene to try to find where your object may have imported into. It's just a, a, what we kind of sometimes call the snowflake problem of downloads because every single object that's created is unique. And then you get to experience what that object is like to work with. We will talk a little bit more about uh, how to prepare and import uh, in the next video. But your homework for this particular session is to take that list that you prepared last week and now come into Sketchfab and search that filtering, downloadable, filtering, Creative Commons, and then search for the various assets that you were looking for. Um, you may need to search specific and they get more generic as you go. Um, and then from there, I do encourage you to go to download Blender, which is blender.org slash download and try unzipping those 3D models into a folder and importing the GLTFs into Blender based on uh, file import GLTF. If you did choose an original file type, uh, hopefully they're FBX or OBJ, you'll file import FBX or file import OBJ or so forth. That is all that you have for this uh, particular episode. We hope you understood a little bit more about how to take that list that you've determined of your components you want how to go search a library for those components. And then potentially, sometimes again, how do you amend on the fly? Well, I couldn't find this thing, so maybe I need to find something else. Um, in the description, you'll also find the link for the Mars planet that we're gonna use. And so you can download the Mars rover and the Mars planet or the zip folder of both parts and the already uh, assembled um, blend file that you can use to follow along. And we'll see you in the next episode as we start to introduce you to Blender. See you then.